Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Faces of FinOps podcast powered by ProsperOps. I'm your host, John Meyer. Faces of FinOps podcast is about highlighting thought leaders in the cloud financial management space and insights on how they're making an impact not only within their organizations, but within the broader FinOps community. Today's conversation is centered around the CTO, CFO relationships, challenges, symptoms, and solutions. Our guest today is Rich Hoyer, who is the CEO and co-founder of FinOptic a boutique FinOps consulting firm. Please join me in welcoming Rich to the show. Rich, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Rich, before we get started, how about you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and where you're from? Sure, I'm, I'm from uh, New England uh, here in the States, of course. Um, my background turned out to be incredibly fortunate for this sort of moment in technology and history. So uh, very briefly, uh, as an undergraduate, I studied economics. Um, after I got out of college, I was in finance, specifically doing uh, valuations of enterprises for mergers and acquisitions. And then I went to business school at the University of Virginia, where I, I really wanted to launch an entrepreneurial career. And so when I got out of business school, I started a little IT support business and I sort of was self-taught in tech completely. I just basically hung out my shingle and said, I do this because I was an enthusiast <laughs> and the work actually came. Uh, I ran that for six or seven years. Uh, and then I wound up um, working for a company called Xenos, which does, it was a startup doing, they're still around, but they, it was a startup doing, at that time a startup uh, doing uh, monitoring for availability and performance. And um, at Xenos, I did a migration from on-prem to cloud. And that's where I, I, now I had skills in finance, I had skills in tech from six, seven years doing IT support, and now I had cloud. And so without realizing it, I was like the perfect FinOps preacher uh, before FinOps was really a thing. Um, so I really sort of tripped and fell into this work with a fortunate background that at, for a time seemed like kind of a liability because it was so odd. It was so unusual. Usually if you're recruiting for somebody in finance, they're finance their whole career. You're recruiting for somebody in tech, they're tech their whole career. I was sort of half wrench and half screwdriver. And then this space became a thing. And it was like, my gosh, this guy's perfect. You know, it's kind of kind of what the experience was. Rich, it really sounded like you were the one man show or the one man band where you had the technical and the finance background. You could uh, technically be your own FinOps team. Yeah, yeah, I was recruited uh, to Cloudability. Uh, when they were starting one of the first pro serve practices, I think that that ever was, uh, by a friend of mine from Xenos, and he'd remembered I had this this interesting background. And and as we talk today, what you'll see is that this is exactly kind of the challenge that FinOps has grown up to address, namely that a lot of the people that wind up managing costs are on the technical side and they don't have the finance background. And so what a lot of FinOps is is sort of creating more split brains like mine, if you will, within the org to combine up those those capabilities. And that's sort of what we're, what we're building. Rich, before we get into things further, how about you tell us a little bit more about Finoptic and your role specifically? Sure. So, uh, so we're a startup, uh, we're a few months into it. And what we're looking to do is, uh, is do something a little bit different in, in the FinOps space. So um, what we see a lot of in FinOps um, is when challenges arise within an organization, usually it's technical people that are on, on the block, if you will, to begin addressing them. When I say challenges, I mean things like measuring, reporting uh, costs, uh, of course, containing costs. Typically, they're, they tend to be on the technical side that are, that are asked to address that. And a lot of the time, what we see uh, is that they sort of lead with automation or tooling because they're technical minds. So usually when they face those challenges, they say, where's a tool that can help me deal with this? And it's not to say that, uh, that, that tools aren't good, tools are great, but we believe that you start with people and processes and use tools as an enabler and a force multiplier of those people and processes. So that's a little bit of what, what we're building. Um, been doing this uh, across uh, other teams prior to starting out on our own here. So I was at uh, Anika for a couple of years, started and built Anika's uh, FinOps team. And I did the same at SADA, which is the Google premier partner. And at both places and at Cloudability, that's the approach that we took is let's go into the organization and focus on A, solving near term issues that they have, but B, enabling their FinOps team to take over those activities. And those are people and process centric uh, activities that we engage on. And then we use tools again as that multiplier, that force, that force multiplier. 
You know, Rich, it's interesting that you say that because our topic today is centering around the relationships between CTOs and CEOs in FinOps. How are you seeing this relationship as it stands today within FinOps? Yes, uh, bifurcated is the short answer. And, and that's really the gap that FinOps has, has grown up uh, within. So if you zoom way out <clears throat> to the way things were before cloud, you had a very clean and neat and orderly procurement process. So imagine you're on the technical side, you know, as I was um, at Xenos, for example, and imagine you've got a bunch of stuff in the data center going end of life, or maybe you have a new project and you need more equipment. So there was an orderly procurement process for that scenario. I would come to my leadership and I would say, um, you know, I need a million bucks for this many servers. You know, here's the labor to rack and stack it. Here's the data center lease costs. And usually, of course, in that process, there would be a business case. They'd say, why do you need this? Well, we have this new project and this is the compute capacity we need to meet it. Uh, here's what we think the incremental revenue will be. Uh, ergo, the ROI on this investment is blah. And they say yay or nay. And from there, the equipment went in the data center. And then it was pretty simple as far as things like finances role um, and accounting, right? So basically, if it were, let's just take a simple example where it was a capital expenditure, meaning we purchased the equipment, then what you're going to be doing is depreciating that over time. So the internal controls in that scenario were very orderly. You know, here, here's the procurement process, business case approved, and the accounting was relatively simple. Now, they may have had some allocations of that depreciation or, or, or if it's a lease allocations of that. But again, the relationship was, was orderly. When cloud became a thing, the reason this relationship became bifurcated is essentially what you did is you removed that orderly procurement process. You essentially democratized procurement to clicks or running of scripts where costs were incurred real time. And that is how the relationship bifurcated. So now you had uh, de facto uh, procurement real time, uh, which wasn't an orderly procurement process. And finance, of course, didn't fully understand cloud tech. Uh, and so the economics of how and why costs were being incurred, um, were, it was something that finance was generally unaware of. So tech had knowledge of the technology and were incurring the costs. And then the bills would sort of arrive in, 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 in accounting and finance. And that's where you got what we used to call a sawtoothed uh, graph of costs, meaning costs would grow, grow, grow. Somebody would get really mad. Uh, they would go to tech and say, what is happening here? Oh, yeah, let me clean up. Costs would drop and rinse and repeat. So FinOps grew up as a discipline to essentially try to bridge that gap, meaning let's get a group of humans together to understand the tech speak, the cloud economics, and they understand finance concepts. So now you needed minds that understood EC2 is a compute instance in AWS, and the same mind need to understand what is amortization, what is depreciation, what is return on equity, all of these concepts. So that's kind of the gap that, that FinOps grows up in. When there's not a FinOps team, the bifurcation remains, and you wind up having this sort of reactive crisis response cadence going on, again, around usually around cost, but also around things like reportability uh, and also budgeting and forecasting can be a real challenge. Rich, I see a new problem here with cloud and FinOps. In the old process, CTOs are very technical. CEOs are typically not technical, but the relationships worked in the current way that things were going. Now with cloud FinOps, how are these new relationships actually going to work? So what we need to do is have a much more regular cadence of interaction. If you put your, your, yourself in a finance seat, imagine all the different parts of the organization that you deal with for, for the work that you do. So specifically, you can take something like budgeting and forecasting, right? What do you think um, is going to happen next quarter in your area? And they, and they move all through the org to try to, to pull together that data. And so they wind up, if you will, um, sort of in, in a shallow manner, speaking a lot of different languages across the org. And it's particularly difficult with cloud, mainly because it's not only that the cloud economics are complex, meaning the dynamics of how costs get incurred, but budgeting and forecasting is particularly challenging in cloud. So if you kind of zoom out for a moment, the very elasticity and flexibility 
of cloud is why the budgeting and forecasting can be such a challenge. Uh, because uh, what we're going to do next period, uh, there's all kinds of different permutations of what might happen, and that might cause different services to be used at different levels. And so if the interaction between finance and, and tech is sporadic, then it's almost like trying to visit a country and speak French once a year, or in this case, once a quarter. Really, really, really challenging, where if you're more immersed, maybe you've got Babel and you're, and you're studying French every day, a little bit, then you're going to do better when you have to have those in-depth conversations. So that's kind of one of the main solutions that we see um, is how do we get those teams on a regular cadence of interaction so that the cloud concepts and dynamics are top of mind on a regular basis for finance. Uh, and then I would also say there's an element of trust here as well. So, um, so what you don't want is to see sort of an adversarial relationship grow up where the technical side has a sense that whenever finance comes knocking, there's a negative connotation to the interaction. That's what we need to get away from. And one of the ways that you can improve trust, again, is with a regular cadence of communication. For example, uh, do we have a relationship in place where the technical leadership is comfortable coming to finance before the overrun is realized at the end of a quarter or a month and say, hey, heads up, uh, we're really trending ahead of things. We're trying to get ahead of it. We want you to be aware of it. That's a very high trust interaction that's going to make that end of month or end of quarter interaction way, way, way better because uh, then finance doesn't feel like they're sort of blindsided. Um, I think that when we've seen a negative dynamic between finance and tech, and sometimes as service providers in FinOps, we'll see this also, a lot of the time, it's a sense from finance of this kind of lack of control or lack of awareness of what's happening. And it's just human nature that if you feel unaware or, um, or, or, or like things are out of control, things are happening that are out of your control, and you think it ought to be in your control, it's very natural for that to be uh, a little, it's going to make people uncomfortable. And when people are uncomfortable, then you can have those negative interactions. So that's sort of thing number one is how do we get a regular cadence of communication um, where there's a little touch of, of the tech speak, the French, if you will, um, you know, every week instead of once a month. Uh, that, that, that's what I'd say the main focus ought to be. Rich, we're talking about a new culture. Typically what happened is finance controlled all the budget, the purchasing power. CTOs would come over to the CEOs, they would come to finance, they would put in their budgets, you know, six, maybe a year ahead of time. And that's how the purchasing happened. Now we're seeing a new wave where the engineers actually have the power to purchase things and finance isn't used to that. Are you seeing this as a shift? I mean, this is, seems really critical that everything and everybody needs to work together within the FinOps culture as one, as a team. Yeah, it is. And, and I'll give you a case study of exactly where that can, can be complex. So one of the areas where there's more of a procurement-like look to cloud would be if an enterprise is about to sign, for example, a large commit. So let's take the AWS universe where you have an EDP and enterprise discount program. Those programs are usually uh, contracts. Um, sometimes they're bespoke, sometimes they're fairly standard, but they're usually in, in a form like this. Um, <clears throat> in exchange for an X percent discount on all services, uh, we're gonna commit to spend not less than, call it 20 million per year for the next three years. So those are deals that usually get negotiated. Typically, those negotiations begin with technical leadership and, and, and a, a provider like AWS or GCP. And a lot of the times, the analytics around what that level of 20 million, uh, those anal the analytics of, of deriving that number are derived on the technical side. And then, of course, because there's a, a, there's a contract about to be signed, a lot of times what we see happen is finance and procurement in particular are brought into that process near the end. And that's an example of, uh, this is like a case study in where things can go a little bit wrong. Um, and usually they're, they're two different things. One is again, if they're brought in late, uh, then it's a fait accompli that the business is gonna be committed to this large amount of spend and they do not like fait accompli. Um, the second thing is, and we see this a lot, is 
the way that technical leaders do their financial analytics is almost a little bit bespoke to tech in a way. And usually it's not presented in a manner, and this is where this, this analogy of language really works, in a manner that finance would ordinarily generate a forecast. And so you can have a little bit of this lack of comfort is, wait, what, what 20, 60 million you're committing? Where are you getting 60 million? Are we really gonna spend 60 million over three years? So that's thing one is that fait accompli dynamic that's sort of being brought in late and a lack of a sense of a lack of control. But the second one, again, is show me your work. And when they get that spreadsheet from the technical side, it's, it's in French, right? It's, it's in this different language. It's being presented in a way that they're not comfortable with. And now you can have that whole negotiation kind of jam up in the organization because of these, if you will, language and culture differences in, in how the analytics are done. And a lot of times what we see is, is, is finance is going to need some translation into finance speak of where the number came from. And candidly, uh, the, the standards that finance is going to have for how much rigor and specificity is in that forecast is quite a bit higher than, than the tech side can be. The tech side, um, sometimes it can be as low resolution as, uh, well, we're at, we're at 18 million now. So can we reasonably expect to get to 20? Yeah, I could see that kind of growth. Finance does not like that. <laughs> they don't like kind of a trend-based uh, sort of, you know, finger in the air. This is what I think it's gonna be. They wanna see something much more like activity-based costing, right? Tell me why you spent the 18 and where the extra 2 million is gonna come from and does it need to be that? So that's a, that's a case study uh, in, in where you can have friction and a case study in, in how this kind of difference in language and culture manifests. And that, again, that's the gap where, uh, where, where FinOps teams, and by the way, um, here's another linguistic thing that we need to pull into this conversation. Typically, when we talk about FinOps, a lot of the emphasis is on uh, an ongoing set of workloads, managing an ongoing set of workloads, and a lot of the emphasis is on controlling costs, typically, and on some around reportability and visibility. Um, we think a little bit differently about this space. We think that FinOps is a subset of something broader that we call uh, cloud finance. And cloud finance encompasses these type of analytics. So for example, financial modeling of a large migration, maybe there are already workloads that are there, but there are more workloads that can be moved over. And is there rigor around the financial modeling of what those new workloads will cost and what the cost takeout in the data center will be? So that's typically something that FinOps teams get involved in, but it's not really where people think, uh, when people think of FinOps, they typically don't think of that part. So imagine, you know, the big globe being cloud finance and one inner globe being FinOps, this is where all the other disciplines in cloud finance need to be. Um, and again, the FinOps team is the right team to do that, but it's a, it's a broader topic. And frankly, we don't see enough emphasis and rigor in this area. And that's something we do see recurring uh, and causing problems between finance and the tech teams. Before we talk about finance or a deep dive into it a little bit more, what, what, what I see here is that finance at one point was able to understand the whole dollars and the budgets. Now with finance wants to put a dollar amount to cloud, they actually want to say this month it's going to cost this and month over month it's going to be the same. But here's what's really happening is that the cloud is variable, right? Their bill's variable. Finance is trying to understand what it's going to cost them in the future. How important is this relationship, not only between finance, but engineering, between DevOps, between CTOs? Now you have engineers that have to talk to finance. Typically, that never happened. Yeah, it's, it's really critical. I mean, the reality is, uh, no matter how rigorous the finance discipline within the, with, with, within the FinOps team, we're still going to need to see finance practitioners become more conversant um, in cloud technologies. Uh, so if you think about the, the challenge that you raised right there, we actually have a bigger problem. <laughs> and that bigger problem is within the technical teams, we see a very wide uh, variation in their ability to do their own forecasting. So if you, if you take a gradient of budgeting and forecasting ranging from the least sophisticated to the most, you could kind of almost break it into four parts, okay? 
So in, in the least sophisticated is no budgeting or forecasting at all. Yes, we do see that, believe it or not, it happens. Um, the next uh, move up the sophistication ladder would be something like I mentioned earlier, like trend-based. So a lot of the tooling uh, does this. A lot of the tooling says, here's what the spend was like today, this week, this month. Ergo, if you extrapolate out statistically, this is where it's gonna go. Um, that's helpful. Uh, it's, it's, it's good for uh, a, a warning of the technical team that things are headed in a direction that's not great. It's not good for budgeting and forecasting for the org. And the reason is, if you think about what the incentives are for, why do we budget and forecast at all? There are really kind of two major focus, focus areas of why organizations budget and forecast. One is, quite frankly, to drive good behavior, right? So if we have a good discipline process of budgeting and forecasting, it enforces discipline to meet it in the next period. Um, so that's kind of going to drive the right incentives. And then obviously the second one would be the sort of some manner of predictability, especially for finance of how much, how, what, what funds are we going to need next period um, and what do we think earnings are going to look like. Um, those, those are not, what, those needs are not well met by trend analysis, especially the incentives one, because it becomes almost uh, a thing of, well, the more I spend, the more budget I get if the budget is based on last period plus X. So we don't really like that approach. Um, the next move up the sophistication layer would be something like this. Um, last period or in recent periods, AWS has been 15.9% of overall costs in department blah. So this is kind of as a percentage of something, right? This is getting better because now if the cost moves and the revenues move or the, or the rest of the cost, there's a context to what those costs are. And if next period it's 17%, that's bad, uh, relatively speaking. And if it's 13%, that's good. So we like this one better. The only problem with it is it still takes uh, as a fait accompli that it was 15.9 and it doesn't have rigor in saying, why was it 15.9? So this is getting better, but it's still not there. And then the most sophisticated would be uh, something we see very little of candidly. We do see it, but rarely. And that's activity-based management. And the way activity-based management works is what are we going to do with the cloud next period? So, uh, and what services and what volume of consumption of those services are going to be related to those activities? Ergo, our budget is X, okay? So on that spectrum, typically we see people biased toward the, less, the first two, especially the second one, the trend-based. And that's purely because of the, the sheer difficulty uh, in, 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 in understanding what the activities will be, what the service levels are going to be, service uh, consumption levels are going to be. So zooming back out, I, I said we have a bigger problem is that on the tech side, uh, we see a really wide range of, of sophistication on these. We see some departments in some orgs that are bumping up against actual activity-based management. We see many more that are sort of last period plus X percent. And, and then IT leadership will compile all of that and bring it to finance. <laughs> um, so, so what we need to see happen is finance to become much more conversant in cloud and start asking probing questions uh, in the sense of how can we get finance to start pushing the technical teams, again, while preserving a good relationship, a, a constructive relationship, but how can we see them start to push for more rigor on the tech side? Um, and that, that's going to require them to be, uh, again, just more conversant in cloud technologies, more understanding what the economics are. It's just going to kind of have to happen at, at some point. Even when there's a FinOps team there, uh, it, there's still going to need to be some, some knowledge gain some knowledge gaps that get filled in on the finance side to sort of make that integration more complete. complete. Rich, talking about forecasting and budgeting, here's a challenging question. Do you feel that there are accurate tools or maybe one tool or two tools, and now too many are just saying, that can, can really predict a budget for cloud or forecast your budget for cloud? Because this is important for finance, but it's also important for engineering to understand what it's going to cost for maybe a certain project or a certain thing that they're building. Can you actually predict cloud cost? Yes, I think the, the native tools get better and better. Um, uh, in, so if you look at you know Azure, GCP, and AWS, the native tools are getting better. 
um, where we see third party tooling being particularly helpful is going to be really in two areas. So one of them is going to be in democratizing visibility into cost. So what the heck do I mean by democratizing? Um, the, the native consoles, a lot of the time, there's an alignment between the security permissions of somebody logging on to a, a, an AWS console, for example, or a GCP console, and the cost reporting they see. Um, that is understandable, but sometimes it's not great for cost management because you may have somebody in an org where the set of, let's take a grouping of accounting, the group of accounts for which they need to see reporting on costs differs from what their console permissions, security permissions are or ought to be. And so that's one of the areas where cost management tooling platforms like CloudAbility or Cloud Health can give a bespoke layer of permissions per user or group. And, and that can allow teams to see costs real time where they otherwise would be maybe co cobbling together reports from accounts for which they don't have permissions, which meant going to other people or things like that. So that sort of thing one is, is getting real time visibility can be dramatically improved with cost management platforms. Also things like uh, if allocations are a problem or if cost segmentation is a problem, you can do some, uh, what amounts to essentially synthetic tagging in those platforms. Um, and so that can also improve visibility for budgeting and forecasting because you can see costs, historical costs segmented in a way that they weren't previously. And that can provide insights into uh, what may happen in future periods. Um, and then the second area, of course, is automation, right? So uh, this is obviously an area where ProsperOps in particular is very strong, um, but there are some contexts where automation of things um, can have sort of those outsized gains, right? Uh, and, and we don't see a huge amount of automation as it relates to cost uh, management in, in the native tooling yet. And so those are, those are really the two areas, is this idea of democratizing, um, being able to sort of customize things like tagging without affecting the production environment, and, and, then, and then automation. Rich, I want to talk about automation a little bit. Now, as an engineer, tagging is very important, but do CFOs, CEOs, do, do they really care about the automation that goes behind the scenes for tagging certain instances, certain products, certain environments, so that they can do chargeback show back within the environment. I think finance isn't terribly concerned with how the sausage gets made, if you will. Uh, I think they're looking for the result. So, um, so, so obviously, if, if if there's good automation around cost controls, then um, you know they're going to see the result in in better financial results. Um, on the reporting side, you know that that's that's an ongoing area of friction. <laughs> we we often hear. We often hear the phrase from finance, everybody else gets me their numbers. I don't understand why this is so hard. And that's a great example of where they're, they're just not speaking French. They don't understand the technical complexities that, uh, that, are, that are involved in, in generating this. Um, so how the technical team gets them the reporting they need, the mechanics that they employ are not interesting to finance, but getting the result is. Um, and, and tooling is, is one answer to that. There's another, there's another answer to it on the technical side, uh, which is getting a conversation started, here we come again, to a regular cadence of communication, getting a conversation started earlier about what the reporting requirements are going to be. So let me give you a, a concrete example of that. Um, there's Project X. It's in development right now. And Project X is going to be some new product or service offering in an enterprise. And engineering are working on the cloud infrastructure that will support Project X. Um, what often doesn't happen and what needs to happen more is in the architecture phase of those workloads for technical leadership to say, OK, we're comfortable with the security of this architecture. We're comfortable with the functionality that will do what we need it to do. We're comfortable that it's going to be affordable. And the last, you know, it's like a three, a three legged stool at that point, we need the fourth leg. Are we going to be able to report to finance on this workload when X goes live? And what we need to have happen is that becomes the fourth leg of the stool. And before they go into production, they approach finance and say, what are you going to need reporting wise before this goes live? And what you see when that conversation doesn't happen 
is a lot of times X goes live and the next month finance goes, okay, what was the cost by customer segment? And technical leadership goes, what? <laughs> because they didn't have that conversation before. And, and what, ha what winds up happening, by the way, it can even be as significant as you've got to re-architect some of the workload. We see this particularly with like containerized environments um, where, for example, the namespace and didn't map to uh, the way that the costs needed to be reported. So again, coming back to the question, automation and tooling, uh, I don't think finance is concerned with the means, they're concerned with the results. And, and these are all the things that have to happen in order for, um, for the, those, the result to be successful. And this is kind of why you see us starting with people in process. That's a human interaction that, that needs to happen that sometimes isn't happening around reportability. And then after they understand what the requirements are, it's up to the technical side to decide what tooling is going to be uh, helpful to bring about that result. Wow, Rich, I can really see it all coming together. I wanna to actually get back to the cloud finance topic that we were talking about a little bit earlier. You mentioned cloud finance, there's cost management, cost optimization, cloud financial management. Like what is the difference between all these? Well, there's a lot of, it, cloud finance is sort of a, a phrase that we're, we're sort of coining as our own. So, so right now that one isn't considered part of it. Um, cloud financial management, I think originally, was focused a lot on the reportability um, of, of sort of understanding the cloud economics. In fact, when we started the, the FinOps team at CloudAbility, from which uh, the FinOps Foundation was actually incubated, and now it's this global uh, you know, uh, center of excellence, if you will, for practitioners to come together, we called that team originally the Cloud Financial Office. And a lot of the original focus of that team was around reportability. So that's kind of the kernel of, of what um, cloud financial management was. I think AWS still calls, calls this cloud financial management. Um, and FinOps beca really became that plus cost containment, plus cost you know, minimization. And um, I think that's good language in the sense that some, some organizations, especially when they're growing rapidly, get a little bit queasy when they hear things like cost reduction or cost containment because it raises the specter of containing the organization's growth. And I've actually had hyper, uh, hyper growth phase clients say, I don't wanna talk about this. I don't wanna talk about taking costs out because we need to hit X growth next period, full stop. Now that's a totally false trade-off because applied correctly, what FinOps really is about is about maximizing efficiency. So that's why the language of cost containment or cost reduction can be problematic. If your AWS or GCP bill goes up next period, is it good or bad? It depends. It depends on did it contribute to yet a larger incremental growth in the business uh, to the positive, right? So cost containment is a little bit problematic, but that's really where it started. It started with um, cloud financial management being a reportability and a visibility discipline. And then cost containment got kind of wrapped up into that. And that's what we think of, most people think of as FinOps today. And, and again, what we're seeing is that that's a very, very important discipline. But when there's an org that either has uh, incremental migrations happening, when there's an org that may be looking to sign a commit uh, on, on a repeated basis, or and there's, a, there's a third area here, which is a modernization play. What we mean by modernization would be, imagine an org did a data center migration and uh, they took a bunch of, of VM or virtual machines and they created them as compute instances. Maybe they're EC2 in, in AWS or what have you. Um, that's usually not a great play for getting the most benefit out of the cloud. What you really wanna do is take those compute instances in an ideal world, and the act of modernization is to break apart the constituent services of each into serverless offerings from the provider. So in the AWS world, this might be, hey, can we make that workload all Lambda scripts or something like that? Well, the engineering <clears throat> effort needed to complete those activities may not be trivial. And so what we need to see is financial rigor on par with that which was required in the migration to begin with. If you're gonna migrate from data center, you, you should have a migration business case where there's a qualitative and a quantitative aspect to it. The quantitative of course is, hey, what's this gonna cost inclusive of, of the migration engineering? 
what is the cost avoidance in the data center as of the migration? The qualitative would be, how does this change our business? Because look, it may be more expensive. I've had business cases, I've done a bunch of these, where it was actually more expensive to move to the cloud. But was that a good thing? Sure, because the change in the business was so compelling that it was worth it. And a good business case will show that. Modernization is the same thing. Um, you, you may want to modernize to reduce costs, but ideally you're modernizing because it changes the operations of the business. So those, those three areas are what are today, uh, it's probably not fair to say that they're not considered part of finance, of FinOps. I think it is fair to say they get very little mind share in the FinOps discipline. And again, that would be migration financial analytics, uh, analytics around a large commit with the provider or modernization financial analytics. So that's kind of how we see the space. Rich, I've got two more questions before we wrap things up. My next question is, what advice would you give CTOs and CFOs who are looking to strengthen their collaboration within the realm of FinOps? And what benefits can you expect to see from doing that? Get beers together. <laughs> you know, it, it, I, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's very much an issue of, of, of trust. Uh, and when we think about trust, uh, a lot of times, Trust is thought of in the sense of um, uh, that you can believe that your counterparty will fulfill their obligations, for example. That's usually the context. I think of trust a little bit differently. Yes, that's, that's part of it. Um, but the other connotation of trust is sort of uh, confidence in the competence of your counterparties. That's another area of trust. You build that by interacting a lot of times in an informal environment. Um, so that you can informally become appraised of the world the other party lives in. So if, if CTOs and, and, uh, and CFOs can, and I think we should broaden this too to technical teams and finance teams, if they can interact on a regular basis and, and open up a window, if you will, into the world they live in, that will increase trust because now they understand the complexities. So if there's a regular cadence um, and the CTO knows the pressure the CFO is under for that report or for that result next period, then, <clears throat> then he or she has context for where the anxiety comes from. And that helps to build trust. It's not just you're being a jerk, <laughs> uh, you know, you're being unpleasantly abrasive uh, you know, for no reason. It's, oh, I know why. And I know why this is a big thing. I need to help out here. And the same would be true on the other side. So if the, if the finance side knows the deadline pressure that the technical side are under, then they're going to be more respectful of their time and, and only ask for things, for example, reports when they really, really need it. What would be the outcome of that? Well, again, it would be the inverse of the frictions that we talk about, right? So everybody has a better experience and both teams get what they need. I think there's one other thing too. We spend a lot of, a lot of time on this. And, and uh, in our activities enabling FinOps teams, this is something we emphasize to a great degree. What are the incentives of my counterparty? Literally, what, is, what does he get paid on? What does she get paid on? <laughs> like, what is their incentive comp? Most technical teams are probably going to be measured on things like meeting deadlines, hitting their SLAs for performance yep. of the workload. So understanding literally where the bonus comes from can help. Uh, the, the finance side know what their incentives are. And, and, and of course, the reverse would be true too. What, uh, here's a person in finance. What is she incentivized on? What are, what are her personal incentives that can contextualize the interaction? And, and that will help build trust also. You, we literally say, find out what they're paid on uh, when, when you're dealing with somebody uh, as a counterpart. Well, Rich, my last question for you is, who are some of the most influential practitioners in FinOps today? Uh, and, and it's very fractured, I think. I mean, obviously, the, the big GSAs would be top of mind as service providers. Um, but we also see pro-serve within folks that, that have tooling as, as, as a set of players. So I, I actually wouldn't say that there are uh, groups or specific service providers that we really follow. Uh, I think the foundation is where a lot of the practitioners are coming together, and we, and we see fantastic collaboration in that space where, if you will, uh, it's not, I wouldn't say there's a, there's, a, there's a thought leader or a group of thought leaders that everybody is kind of looking up to. What we're seeing in the form of the foundation is a lot of mixing um, of best practices. Exact, the foundation is doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is to bring together the best, the best thinking. And so now they have their, you know, their annual um, 
you know, gathering FinOps X where people come together and give talks. It's very exciting because we're all figuring this stuff out real time. And in 10 or 20 years, we're gonna tell the story of, of how all this happened and where all this came to be. And that mixing of a lot of different providers and a lot of different um, practitioners is, is actually gonna be how we're gonna tell that story. Rich, I got to wrap things up, but I want to really thank you for highlighting not only our topic that was centered around CTOs and CFOs relationships, the challenges, the symptoms, and the solutions, but we've got a lot more to talk about in the future. Thank you so much for joining me, Rich. Thank you. Everybody, this has been another awesome episode and discussion around faces and FinOps powered by our good friends at ProsperOps. Be sure to hit that like, subscribe, and notify. Plus, you want to check out the ProsperOps blog. Until next time, see ya.